Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Taking Care of Business with the University of Buffalo Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. I'm Tom Albrecht, and I'll be with you today. Um, thank you for joining us. We're going to be talking today about price and pricing and this concept of, is your price too high? So as we dig in, um, a lot of this is about um, consumer behavior. So let's dig in a little bit. And before I get started here, I want to make sure that we thank our sponsors that uh, make all this possible, the Bonadeo Group and Uniland. Thank you both. And again, I always remind everybody, we are celebrating our 30th year. Uh, CEL has helped over 1,400 business owners in the West York community, uh, representing over $2.3 billion of annual revenues in the community and um, over 22,000 employees. So we're really proud of that. We are uh, right in the middle of uh, putting together our 31st class. So if you're uh, interested in our core class, we've got a few seats left. So make sure you reach out to the center and learn more about that. So let's jump right in. And, and before we can talk about price, we need to start by looking at what the average small business is up against. So let, let's start with, uh, take a quick look at Walmart and look at this massive logistics machine and just see how much impact companies like this are having on our economy. So I've got some numbers for you from 2017. Um, real quick, I'll go over their revenues were $500 billion. So to give you a little bit of an idea, the entire GDP of Norway is only $371 billion. So we have, so we have one company doing $500 billion. They did almost $12 billion in e-commerce sales. Um, they've had 45 years or had 45 years consecutive years of dividend increases. They see over 270 million unique customers each week. And the grocery store sales alone were $200 billion of that earlier uh, total that I told you. They've got over uh, 11,000 stores, actually approaching 12,000 stores in 28 countries. Um, and, and when you really look at this, if you kind of peel it back a little bit, think about it this way, they sell over $50 million of product every single hour of every single day. They're so big, they, they expect additional cooperation from their suppliers and they get it. They get better terms. They move product like no one else in the world. They get vendors to manage your inventory. And, and these are things that you can probably as a small business owner only dream of. So let's look at another company that transformed you know, the, the retail world or the food world years ago, and that's McDonald's. So the golden archers in a sense have raised consumer expectations Sounds a little bit funny, but they have a business model that leads us to expect the, the three C's, convenience, cleanliness, and consistency. Um, and this has been pushed out all over the place. So no matter where you go to a McDonald's, you, you can relatively expect to get the, the same product no matter, no matter where you go. Then enter the big box stores. Um, that, that came online years ago. So big box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot, where you have this illusion of low price, a use of loss leader, um, and large profits on items that we typically don't shop or can't shop. So these are some of the things that as a business owner, you're running up against. And then maybe the one of the final ones I'll just talk about a second here is, is e-commerce and the impact that that's having on, on our retail businesses. So many of our customers that might shop in a retail store that we own are pre-shopping on the internet. Um, often they will pre-shop in the internet, come into your store or vice versa. They'll pre-shop in your store, go on the internet and search for the best price and not end up purchasing it from you. What's, what's interesting about e-commerce and many small businesses are starting to engage in it, but the question is, can you engage in it at the level that you need to be successful? Over 9% of all retail sales now are happy on e-commerce and that, that is growing like crazy. So to extend our discussion on this a little bit, let's look at one of our, you know, almost everybody's favorite here, Amazon. I can't think of anybody that probably doesn't shop at Amazon, including small business owner. Um, so Amazon does some interesting things too. You would think that they wouldn't care much about their customer, right? They're this big giant, giant uh, corporation. But even the CEO, whatever your rank at Amazon, all employees, including the CEO, 
spend two days every year at the customer service desk. So they're, they're really paying attention to customer service, understanding the process. Um, it's very, very important to them. They're a massive company. They have over 466,000 full and part-time employees. And that, those numbers are back from 2017. I'm sure they're much bigger today. They've also begun to bring on their own brands or create their own brands. So some of that they're doing by purchasing existing brands, like they purchased Zappos recently, but they're also creating and branding their own brands in clothing and different lines um, because of the volume of materials that they sell. So another thing that's impacting us just before you get to prices, here's, uh, here's an Amazon uh, warehouse. They're, the square footage of their warehouse is just amazing. Um, if you were to look at all the square fo footage of their warehouses, you could fill 700 Madison Square Gardens. Um, or if you would think about the volume of it, these warehouses would fill 10,000 Olympic size pools. So really, really amazing. Um, and some of these fulfillment centers, there, there's one in Phoenix, Arizona, that's 1.2 million square feet. Um, and employees have reported that they'll walk up to 11 miles per shift in a facility like this, just to give you an idea. Now you, the, you know, the average small business owner, this is what we're competing against. And of course, Amazon Prime, it was just Prime Day the other day. There's nearly 100 million Prime members in the US today. And those members spend an average of $700 a year um, with Amazon. So again, I, I guess if I was sitting on the other end of this, I'd, I'd be saying, so, so Tom, well, why the depressing story here? And I is small business done? And I don't want you to think that at all. I just wanted you to see the world that you're competing in, why price and understanding price or beginning to understand it is so important to your business. So we're not done as small business owners. It, you just need to find your competitive advantage. And I, what I wanted to show you up front here is it's likely isn't going to be low cost provider. But the good news is, if you remember from earlier webinars that we did, we don't just buy with our head, but we also purchase um, otherwise. So the head decisions, if you remember, would be based on price and is it a fair, um, is it a fair purchase based on quality, selection, what I'm getting. But don't forget, we also purchase with our heart. So assuming we don't want to throw down in the mud and wrestle Amazon, we can still find segments in the market where we, we can be successful. So today what I wanna do is to introduce you, and that's all I can do today is introduce you to some of the concepts behind pricing. If you're really interested in this subject, a lot of what I'm gonna be, be talking about today comes from uh, Herman Simon and the other person I'm gonna talk about some information is coming from Marlene Jensen. Um, I would highly re recommend you read this book. Um, not, not a really hard read, it does get into some behavioral science when it comes to pricing. But Herman Simon is like the person um, if you're really interested in understanding some of these concepts that I'm gonna share with you today. But let's start by looking at what does price actually even mean? So in its simplest form, it's just the number of monetary units you must pay for a good or service. But when you think about it, it's not that simple because it can often include a base price. Sometimes there's discounts, there's bonuses, there's rebates, there's special conditions, special offers. Um, you'll run into differentiated prices based on customer segment or location. You'll see pricing based on complementary products like razors and razor blades, um, phones and data plans. You'll see pricing based around additional service. You'll see pricing based on multiple dimension. So sometimes there's an upfront or an onboarding fee, an upfront charge, and then a usage fee that follows. We'll see prices that are bundled, and many of you may use uh, the concept of bundle pricing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And final price is really based on, um, or fairness in price is really based on personal negotiations. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit too. And then there's also wholesale, retail, and manufacturers suggested prices. So pricing can mean a lot of different things, but and it goes by many names, price, price tag, premiums, fees, some people in speaking will call an honorarium, taxes, tuitions, tolls, rent, commissions, et cetera. These are all different words that we might use for price. And we have to remember, no matter what we call it, everything has a price. 
And Price is here for really three main tasks for us, to create value, so quality, performance, and design can, can really drive the customer perception of value, to communicate value, how you describe your product, the selling proposition, the brand, all influence customer perception of price. And this is where, as small business owners, we, we can be competitive in the marketplace. And retaining value, what happens post-purchase is decisive in shaping a lasting positive perception with your potential customers. So let's look at these um, individually for a second. Um, so especially I wanna look at creating and communicating the value part. Again, we'll go back to this head decisions and heart decisions and remind you again of customer loyalty and the importance of heart decisions. Offering true value is a necessary, but by no means sufficient condition for um, success when we communicate price. So we need value, absolutely, but there's lots of other ways that people communicate value or perceive value, I should say. Brand, when it comes to pricing, is just as important as product is. And the only fundamental driver of willingness to pay is the perceived value in the eyes of the customer. And I wanna dig into this a lot today to talk about perceived value and how important it is and how our relationship personal relationships with money as business owners might affect our perceived value of our own product and we may be pricing things wrong. And just remember what you make or pr produce, that actual product, to kind of close this section up, the actual product, the tangible product, is only part of the perceived value and ultimately um, the perception around price. So is your price too high? Um, or is it too high or not? So what do customers really mean when they say your price is too high? I think that's the first uh, question you have to ask yourself. And there, there's a few different things that they might be thinking. They may believe that your product is the best value or, there's a subs or there is a substitute that's better value in, in your eyes out there, in their eyes out there. They may like the product, but they don't think they can actually afford it. So they might come back to you like the price is too high. They are trying to get you to lower their price. That may be another, the price is too high scenario. They're playing with you, toying with you. Um, or often price isn't the issue at all. There's something else that's holding them back from making the purchase. And it may be they don't have the ability to pay right now, but price complaints are an easy way for your customer to end the conversation. So when somebody tells you your price is too high, don't take that and stop right there. All I'm saying is let's look into this a little bit further and understand what the customer might really be saying. So let's talk about priced objection a little bit. And here's some interesting statistics around sales presentations. Um, after a sales presentation, 19% of people buy no questions asked. 20% do their very best to postpone the buying decision, and 61% question price in some fashion. So there you go right off the bat. 60% of people are questioning price in some fashion. But again, I wanna, I wanna come back to the, is it really price though? So of those people, when you dig in a little bit, of the more than 50% that mentioned price, 44% say price isn't the only issue it's price mixed with some other objection. Um, as I said earlier, I, I can't afford it right now. I don't have that much money with me. And of all those people, only 17% say price is the only issue. They'll buy only if they believe you have the lowest per price. So I'm gonna say as a small business owner, probably that's not your ideal customer. Those 17%, I would suggest that we probably start to think about not worrying them about as a, as a potential customer and focus on the other 83% of people out there. So again, when you look at price objection, um, remember it's always a consideration but not, not the only determining factor. And many, many, many customers will often pay more if they perceive value. So all other things being equal, price is simply the tiebreaker that customers use. So your price might be higher and that's okay. And I'd suggest that may be a really good thing, but I wanna challenge you to think about your price is not too high or may not be too high. And really ultimate gut check 
with this for me is when you think about it, if it's, if it's always in a factor, but not the determining factor, would you, would, what would your customer or where would they buy if price were not an issue? And you have to ask yourself, all other things being equal, if my price was the same as the other persons that they're looking at, other, other companies' price that they're looking at for a similar product, would it really be my company that they would choose to purchase? So if you take price off the table, what I'm really asking you is are you providing all those other extra things around perceived value that, you can, that can give you some advantage with pricing in the marketplace? So why is pricing important? We don't wanna leave money on the table, that's, that's for certain. And really the quickest way to increase your profits if you're able to do it is to raise your price. Um, many independent business owners don't know the true value of their products to the customer and you don't want to be guessing about this. The other, the other challenge around pricing is if you're constantly adjusting and changing your prices, it can really confuse uh, the market. So let's look, let's, let's look at top independent retailers for a second around pricing to give some of us a little bit idea about what some of these companies um, are doing. So the, the top tier independent retailers, these are independent retailers in the top 10% in their industry. These companies find ways to grow despite competition from box stores, the internet, and everything else that I, I you know, mentioned when I first started this, this webinar. What are they doing that others are not doing? Are they simply lucky or do you think they have some type of plan? What strategies are they using? And really what I want to do right here is stop and say, can we learn from them? So here's some of the, the areas where top tier independent realer, retailers are distinguishing themselves from many other small businesses. One is they invest in their property. So perception is reality. Um, especially when you're talking about retail, you want to be able to wow your customer. They do all they can to develop repeat, repeat business. Um, so things like we talked about in earlier webinars about customer loyalty and taking care of our most loyal customers and trying to get them to come back and bring their friends with them is top of mind with this group of re retailers. They work really hard to increase their gross margins and how do they do that? They know really key performance uh, metrics. They work hard on purchasing properly. They understand other metrics like average ticket price and they work to increase those average ticket prices. They often structure pay for their team members to influence desired results and, and allow them to wow their customers. And ultimately what, they're, what many of these companies are doing is they're blowing away their customers with service. So when they do that, this is giving them an additional perceived value that um, will allow them to compete, not solely on price, product for product, but the perceived value in the eyes of the customer and their willingness to pay for something more that they're getting. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna look at, at price, there's some things that you really, really need to, uh, to look at as we look at pricing strategies. There's a bunch of pricing strategies that you can look at as a company. I'm gonna introduce some of these quickly to you today. But to determine a strategy, you first know, you've gotta know your co customer, your competition, your business conditions. You absolutely have to understand your financials, your cost of goods sold. You've got to know your true costs. And you've got to know your true costs by product line or by buckets. Um, you need to know your, your channels or your segments um, it, in the marketplace. What are your marketing objectives? Are you trying to gain market share? Are you trying to kill the competition? These all would require different pricing strategies. Is your price logical? Or is it just something that you pulled out of a hat? And again, perceived value, perceived value, perceived value. You don't want to be a commodity as a small independent business owner. We have to add increased perceived value um, in, in order to charge a higher price. So let's look at, at some of the different pricing strategies. There's prestige pricing where higher quality automatically equals higher prices. So when you think about this, this type of pricing, it may not impact most of us as small business owners, but 
Certainly prestige pricing is very, very important. This is a type of pricing where if your price isn't high enough, the perceived value is poor and it hurts your brand. So charging more is actually a value when you have this type of product. And sometimes higher quality just doesn't matter. Or does it? So when is a commodity not a commodity? So again, price is always a determining factor, but then there's many items where we may say type is, or tape is a commodity, but is tape a, co a commodity? Or are there different qualities of tape? And, and I might argue that there is perceived, there's actual value when you purchase tape. And if you ever got a really, really terrible, um, un, you know, low price roll of tape where it's tearing all the time, ripping, uh, maybe a great example is if you paint it all, there's definitely different qualities of tape that you use for, um, for um, taping off for painting. So sometimes what appears to be a commodity is not a commodity and higher quality will get you a little bit of advantage. But some customers in, a, in an area like tape it's, are going to see it as a commodity. Then there's some other areas of value where a very small difference in quality can be a deal breaker and price doesn't matter. So many of us don't question um, if, we're, if we need surgery, we're gonna want the highest quality surgeon. And um, I know in healthcare prices are somewhat standardized, but if they weren't standardized and you were gonna self pay, um, at this point, a very small difference in quality can be a deal breaker and it's not so much about price, it's all about quality. But going back to higher prices and prestige pricing, there's been some research done um, around pricing that shows that sometimes when you raise prices, you'll get more sales. So here's what happened to four quality ratings of four different products after a price increase with no changes to the quality of the product. So taking a product off a shelf and actually raising the price without literally changing the product and leaving it next to other products, the perfume where the price was raised um, went up 21% sales, sunglasses up 14%, computers up 10% and, and basic tomato sauce off the shelf went up 10%. So sometimes higher prices will equal more sales. There's another area of pricing that you'll be exposed to all the time and many of you may want to consider using this in your business and that's price anchoring effects or good better best you'll see this often with software where you have a base price of software you have a deluxe and then you have a middle almost everybody is buying the middle the magic of the middle this is a psych psychological tactic that is getting you to anchor to the middle so neither the cheapest or the most expensive wine is attractive to most of us but the profit generated by the product, the profit being generated by the product in the middle is really being influenced by the product that other people never buy, meaning the, the higher end. And you'll see this on menus often all the time. Do people buy the 200 bottle, 300, 400, 500 hour bottle of wine? I'm sure occasionally somebody does, but it makes the by having that wine on the, on the menu, it makes the middle or, the, or potentially the higher profit wine the one that's easier to choose because we also don't want to go down on the other end once we've been anchored to the higher end. We don't want to go and buy the least expensive bottle or glass of wine typically. Another area that I find fascinating is moon pricing. So moon pricing is the price that no one ever pays. Um, and I probably shouldn't use brands on here, so I won't, but we'll just say that it's very common in retail clothing um, where companies, it, it seems like you would never shop there unless you had a 10%, 20%, 30% off coupon. Super common in, in retailing, very common in appliances, um, especially with some of the bigger box stores. And I'll give you a quick example. Personally, um, I had a picture and I've lost it and I wish I had it of luggage that I saw in a box store, a carry-on piece of luggage. It was very average luggage, um, some, some type of average name brand. It was on sale for 80% off, but the sticker price on it was $395. So no one was ever gonna pay $395. So this is moon pricing, very common. Um, often, once in a while, you'll see uh, companies that do 
for that do this too much and fail to take their products off of sale price often enough can run into um, problems with the attorney general's office in certain states sometimes and you'll you'll occasionally see a lawsuit around some of this type of pricing so again a great read if you're interested in in uh the psychology of pricing so confessions of a pricing man i would would encourage you to get that so another Another book I want to talk about that's not in print anymore. This is much older. So this is a work of Marlene Jensen. I believe um, she's at Lock Haven University now, a professor um, in, their, in their business school. She did this um, really short book or pamphlet called Pricing Psychology Report that goes back in 2003. And I want to just show you some interesting tidbits around pricing that you may have been exposed to out in the marketplace. But before I show you these, I, I know if Marlene was on this call, what she would be probably saying to you is whatever, whenever we're talking about pricing, what's really important about pricing is test, test, test. You have to do a lot of A-B testing. You can't just assume what I'm gonna show you is gonna work in your industry, it's gonna work with your product, but you can start to test some of these ideas if you wanted to. So let's start with some, some common things that you, you're probably very familiar with. So one of the tests that they did is which of these two prices will pull in more buyers, $9.99 or $10, literally a penny different. The $9.99 price will pull in 10 to 20% more sales. Um, so again, this is a psychological barrier that when you break over the $10 mark or the $19.99, Mark, um, it can be a barrier psychologically, behavioral psychology, where your mind is thinking that something is a lot more expensive. So a lot of testing done around this, where this starts to kind of fade away is when we get into larger numbers, um, prices like on cars and big ticket items, you typically won't see this type of pricing because it doesn't matter. This is something that you can take away to your business right away. Um, and I don't see this too much with retail businesses, but, but once you get over $100, don't use cents. So often people will, will put $250, sometimes people will be $250 or $249.99. It really doesn't make sense when we get into um, to bigger products, it especially does not make sense with prestige products. Because if you're gonna buy a prestige product, you're not counting pennies. You're almost insulting people when you do that. So another reason for, to drop the zeros here is if we look at this quickly, psychologically, where our mind just sees $250 with the decimal points just looks to us like a much bigger number. So you can, you can use this in your own pricing relatively safely. Now I'm gonna show you um, three slides in a row here. And what I want you to do is just mentally, or if you've got a piece of paper handy, look at these prices in front of you. And I want you to, to look at price testing. This is an example of price testing. I want you to write down which of these numbers that you're about to see pulls 10% more orders than any other. So this is all about price testing and it's done often in direct marketing. Um, I have an e-commerce company. We do a lot of A-B testing um, and are able to do it online quite easily where we'll present different, different pricing um, segments to consumers to see which prices are pulling better. So look at these numbers here. There's 10 numbers and pick the price that you believe would pull more sales than the other. I'm gonna show you another set of numbers. And again, just look through these numbers and which number do you, you think is gonna, in the price test that they did, pulled more. And what we're really looking for here is this concept of a magic number in pricing. And here's uh, another set of numbers. And again, which of these prices of the 10 prices in front of you are gonna pull 10% more of sales? And there's been millions of direct marketing tests around this, and the magic number is seven. So if we go back here, the price of 997, the price of 1997, and the price of $197 pulls on average 10% more. Uh, why we're not really, really sure. It could have something to do with the concept or, or the thought that seven psychologically is a lucky number. But again, this information was done by testing and you've got 
You can't just assume it's gonna work. You could test this with your own pricing and mark some things, uh, the same product differently and see if one pulls more. You can, you can easily do this if you have a e-commerce site. There's another phenomenon that they found that was associated with the, with the number seven, and that was blue in the number seven. When you ask to select a number and a color between zero to nine, the magic number seven would be selected 21% of the time, um, and also with the, with the color blue. So it doesn't matter where the magic number is in the product pricing either. It could be at the beginning of the product, for instance, 75. It could be 127. It could be like here at the end of the product, 197. And it could be 175 in the product. And when Marlene wrote this report, she suggested not the one number not to use was 777, just because it would appear um, gimmicky. There was no basis behind that, nothing, no testing done but just the appearance of something being gimmicky. So another number that tests really interestingly is the number eight, and especially in certain cultures where it's the infinite number of infinite good fortune, um, ending in the number eight has an impact, <clears throat> and the eight and blue concept works together also. But again, the, the point here is to test, test, test. So this is a, this is a little bit hard to read, but the, here's another um, testing, uh, some price testing that went on, and this concept now of, of poison prices. So if you look at the, the testing of the, the different prices here, we have prices tested at 295, 395, and 495. Below it is 49% of people purchase at 295, 17% at 395, 34% at 495, Tested again at 295, 365, 425, so lowered that upper price, and 56% purchase at the 295, only 10% at the 365, and we 34% at the uh, 425. So if you look at this, then tested 127, 137, 147, only 2% pulled at the 137. So in every case here, the three is the big loser. Um, and it's not just the amount of people that pick that price, but if you do, if you do the numbers and you, and you work out, well, what's the dollar volume if we sold product at, the, at those percentages, it's always the three that happens to be the poison pricing. Another area where you can look at a uh, different pricing strategy here is differential pricing. So differential pricing works for some businesses and it certainly can in increase profits, especially where you have fixed overhead and maybe facilities that aren't being used. So early birds, so restaurants can use this, movie theaters use this. So this is the early bird diners or the early movie show. This is where you can gain a slice of the market that you might otherwise miss. So you've got the fixed cost of your operation sitting there, potentially empty or semi-empty. So can we attract a group of people by lowering our price and increasing our volume? So the way we're really separating people are into these two groups, one that's price sensitive and one that's not price sensitive. So the price sensitive people are gonna come at the inconvenient times for the non-price sensitive people. You can also do it by modifying your product. You'll see this all the time in the automobile industry where we'll have the bare bones model versus the loaded model. You can set volume discounts, you can use coupons or re rebates, which is a bit of an old school technique, but it still works um, in, today's, in today's market. But remember, legally, you can't discriminate or fix prices. So you can't work with other companies to say that we're going to set or fix a price in the market. A Couple other psychological tricks that you'll see in discounting, and um, I do, you know, maybe shouldn't label these as tricks, but um, these are, are discounting behaviors that people are attracted to. So which attracts more people, the $49 blender or the $69 blender marked down to $49? Uh, every, almost every single time, the second option is gonna pull better because our human nature wants a discount. And if we want to discount, even if we have no reason to believe the higher price was realistic in the first place. So this is behavioral economics. You'll see this in many, many of the box stores, Kohl's, Sears, JCPenney, um, where everything, I don't want to say everything, but products have a sticker price 
and things are marked down from the sticker price. Not everything, but enough products to, to um, entice people and give this illusion of, uh, of savings. And the, the research even goes on to say, although prestige product, you don't want your prices too low, even buyers of Rolex watches, um, if they're going to take, if they have the opportunity to take a discount, will pull better if something is marked down. Now, the, the danger there with prestige products is we have to be careful not to mark our product down where we start to hurt and ruin our brand. So you will not see markdowns typically with prestige products. We talked about this a little bit more. Um, a lot of products sold at retail often carry a list price, which is higher than what people expect to pay. Cars, for sure. Electronics, often, although not so much anymore as electronics have become uh, more of a commodity, but um, still times there's some negotiating with electronics. So for you, the small business owner, this causes a bit of a problem because we, we've pretty much hired or wired um, buyers expect and want a discount. So consider pricing new products high enough that you can give room to discount if you need to, but there are exceptions to that. Again, prestige pricing, if you're adding a ton of extra value and the, you know, hot new models of cars, if you remember Beanie Babies in their day, there's, there's often times where you don't want to discount, um, but be prepared for many of your customers wanting to see some discounting or expecting it in some way. So how might you look at this at, you know, at the website level? Does, does this matter in e-commerce? So a lot of times when in websites we're told, focus on content, focus on content. Um, and this really doesn't apply to your standard website, but we're talking about an e-commerce store. Deals beat out content over and over again. Now, that being said, <clears throat> having an e-commerce site myself, I do know content matters for search engine optimization and other reasons, but people still are looking for a deal over the quality of a website. So despite what we've been told about making our website sticky, we also have to be competitive out there. <coughs> Excuse me, because once we're on the web, now we're being compared to everybody else. So the other thing you, you, you might look at is a sell sheet where we could promote value versus price paid. So an example for this would be um, at the Center for Entrepreneur Leadership, there's an alumni association that is um, affiliated with this. If they were charging membership dues, that typically could be two, three hundred dollars a year. Um, if they were charging a due like that, they may lay out a sell sheet showing that actually you're getting thousands of dollars worth of value for the price that you're paying for membership. And you'll see this a lot with membership. The other thing I want you to be aware of with discounting or with, uh, with pricing is that penalties really tick off your customer. So although you have the opportunity now in some states to charge a premium for somebody using a credit card, people absolutely hate this. Um, if, you're gonna, if you feel like you're losing money in a situation like this, it's certainly much better to, to build that in your price um, or to even give a cash discount if people wanna pay cash but to not go and try to penalize your, your customer for using something like a credit card in sales. And a couple other areas are this, the mystique of scarcity and how does that Im impact prices? So scarcity increases perceived value. You'll see this with waiting lists for sports tickets, for shows. Often a show that appears to be sold out isn't sold out. It's sold out to, to create the perception of value. Um, this is why scalpers exist. This is why people fight over that hot Christmas toy. And most of us don't really have a scarce product, but we can create the concept of scarcity by limiting the product um, X amount per customer, just a certain amount of days left to buy, good for the first 100 customers. So you can keep create scarcity by limiting the product in the market. Um, and, a, and a few other things that, as I bring this, start to bring this to a, to a close for you, um, in discounting, there's also psychological price bearers and pricing. I talked a little bit about these, but there's risky areas increasing the number on the furthest left of your price is where the riskiest of all is moving from one digit, so one through nine, to two digits. That's where we get the most 
price pushback. So I use the example of $9.99 to $10 or $19.99 jumping it up, or I should say $99 jumping up to $100 where you go from two to three digits. So moving from $9 to $9.99 probably isn't going to hurt your sales. Moving from $19.15 to $19.99 probably not going to hurt your sales. $190 to $9.99 probably not, et cetera. The key word here is probably, and just be careful as you push over and you go to that next digit, as you move from two to three digits, three to four digits, four to five digits, when you're right on the cusp of that price increase, you have to think about it carefully and make sure you test it. And as we bring this to, a, to somewhat of a close here with these last few slides, your, your price might not be too high. And I really want you to consider that as we leave here today. I just gave you a, a really brief overview and pricing is its, its own science, its own art, and we can spend a lot of time on it. For those of you that might be in Class Connections, we'll be digging deeper into this on Thursday morning. But your price may not be too high. So when people say your price is too high, think about why are they saying that? It may not be about your price and make sure that your price actually isn't too low. So here's some danger signs that you're pricing your product too low. And I see this all the time with small business owners. You haven't researched your competition, you researched your competitors, they're all priced higher. Should be a red light going off right there. You tell a competitor what you charge and they show a sense of a smile. You sell without ever having someone trying to haggle or negotiate. Especially if you have a higher ticket item or your consultant, if everybody is taking every single proposal you put in front of them, your price is way too low. Um, a no one tough negotiator buys from you or takes the first price you have to offer. Um, really prevalent uh, if it, in larger ticket items. Your buyer looks at your price quote and suggests you resubmit a higher price quote. This happens all the time in contracting. I used to be in the commercial landscape business. And if we would go to subcontract something, people would come back with, with prices that were so ridiculously low that you absolutely knew that they would not be able to do the work as described in the RFP. So this is another area, if you're always winning on subcontracts, I'd really, really be looking at my pricing. Or if a general contractor is always sending back saying, wait, we really wanna look at you, but you need to relook at this. So when I started here, we started talking about Walmart and I thought I would tell you a little bit about Walmart pricing. So um, Walmart used to say always low prices and I think now they talk more about save money, live better. And Walmart rarely has sales, but they're interesting in their pricing. You rarely will see a 99 cents in a Walmart, but what will you see? 87, things that end in 87, things that end in 88. Is it a coincidence that we talked about the magic number being seven and eight? I don't know. Um, you'll see things ending in 27, 76, and in 76 cents. Again, odd pricing, but the magic numbers are in there. They're ultimately branding their image as being the low price provider. And some of the thoughts are, is it about the magic number or is it about the perceived value of Walmart just saved me at 88 cents, they saved me 12 cents on a dollar or 13 cents or, or whatever it is. That's that's a bit of the, the pricing mentality. But what you have to remember in these large box stores is everything isn't a low price. So if you have a small business and you're competing in some way with these companies, what I really recommend you to do is what I would call shopping a basket. Take a basket of products off the shelf of your stores that you might consider a good mix of products that you regularly sell, add up that basket and go shop the same exact basket at a Walmart, a Lowe's, a Home Depot. And often what you'll find is your basket from your store is less than or not that much more than Walmart's basket. And the reason behind that is there's an illusion of low price created by end cap displays and common products that we all know the prices of being marked at extremely heavy discounts to create the, perce the perception of low price and the margins come off of other items. So that could be an advertising tactic for you too, to show if, if you're in a business that people say, well, I can go to Walmart, I can go to a bigger box store. You may wanna shop a basket and actually show the basket and put it, put it there to your customers and say, 
here's a basket shopped at our company or our business, here's a basket shopped at a larger box store and compare them so people can see. So two slides left here and let me close up with this. I'm gonna, I've got my Danger Will Robinson slide up here to remind me to, to make sure that I warn you that everything I just told you needs to be tested with your own business. Test, 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 test. You have to test pricing. Um, don't just assume that if you see it and it will work with somebody else, it will work with you. Although there's been millions of tests with some of the, of the pricing that I'm um, showing you, it's not necessarily gonna work with you, but you certainly, certainly can test it. The big thing I want you to take from today is, yes, you can compete in this crazy world of commoditization where every product is being driven to its lowest price on the internet in large box stores. The way you compete is by increasing the perceived value of your customer where people are willing to pay more for increased customer service, customer loyalty, beautiful place to shop, and all those things that your customers um, may can want and you can provide that the internet and large box stores can't. And my final warning to you is this. One of the biggest problems or issues that I see when we talk about price with um, businesses that come through our center are with the entrepreneur or the business owner themselves. And this is your own per personal perception of price or what, what I maybe would rephrase and say, your relationship with money. Do not, by in, under, in any, under any circumstances, let your relationship with money, your personal relationship, impact how you price your product. We, are, we all have a personal relationship in money that's based on the circumstances of how we perceive price, what we think is expensive, based on how we were raised, based on perhaps what we have, financial times we've been through, um, what we think about savings. So I want you to, to, to be doubly careful not to price your products on your own perceived value because for many, many small business owners, your perception of what your price should be is often much lower than what the market's perception should be. The best way to, to find that out again is to ask your customer to test those different prices. So with that, I am gonna um, pull things together here for you. And I don't believe we have any questions. I don't see any. So let me um, end here and I went a little bit long today. Hopefully you'll be able to join us for our next webinar. So we're gonna, we've talked a lot about customer loyalty before. We've talked today about pricing and you'll always hear me coming back to how do we create value for our small businesses that allow us to differentiate, differentiate ourselves in the, in the market. And next month we're gonna talk about blue ocean strategy or how to leave the competition awake by literally trying to get out of the bloody ocean of competition that your company may be in and trying to find your own blue water to swim in where you don't have to be um, focused on being low pr price provider to survive. So thank you again for joining us um, and from the Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. We hope you all have a great day and we'll see you next month. Take care.